Hello and welcome to another Hand Drink Solo Wine Report and today we're focusing on a rather remarkable viticultural technique called high density controlled grazing. And I think this is the first time anything like this is being rolled out anywhere in the South African wineland. Now the entire idea behind this was inspired by projects in Zimbabwe and in Mexico and in the United States, all of which aimed to reverse some rather tragic desertification. The viticultural team at Hartenberg in Stellenbosch, South Africa, have begun adapting this high density controlled grazing technique to be put to use in their vineyards. And they've been achieving some rather remarkable results that go far beyond simply providing compost or controlling weeds. Just Two of the fascinating results that these guys have achieved is, first of all, cover crop that re sows itself year after year, and second of all, it's grapes that at the time of harvest appear to have some dramatically altered technical analysis with regards to its ripeness and acid levels, which we hope will mean much better wine in the glass. But long before we get to wine in the glass, we have to go right back to the beginning-ish. Now we know that animals, and in particular sheep, have been used for centuries in vineyards, as we said, to control weeds and also to provide natural fertilizer. And so at a glance, Hartenberg's use of Ancoli and Dexter cattle in their vineyards may seem pretty run of the mill, or at best a sort of super size me cattle alteration of those same centuries old techniques. But we're gonna spend a little bit of time focusing on why the high density portion of this whole idea is in fact an absolute game changer and potential paradigm shift for the very idea of using animals in viticulture. But before we do all that, we need to zoom out and take a look at viticulture and agriculture in general, because to appreciate the role of high density controlled grazing, we need to understand the set of problems faced by viticulturalists and farmers around the world, as well as the current set of solutions that they are employing to overcome these. There was a time back in the day when pretty much all farmers agreed that all crops needed to thrive was the right list of chemicals in the soil in order to both feed them and protect them. But the more farmers learnt about soil, the more they realized that actually it wasn't just the nutrients and chemicals that was needed, but rather the right mix of fungi and bacteria and general microbial growth in the soil in order to help the plant access those lists of chemicals. Of course, this was a dramatically inconvenient truth because the miracle fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides that had come out of the so-called green revolution and which had made farming apparently so easy were in fact killing the very microbes in the soil that farmers had just learned their plants actually quite needed. So a new paradigm was developed, one that said instead of using harmful chemicals from outside the system, instead they would look at the ecosystem around the farmland and use tools from within that system in order to both feed and protect the vines and neutralize pests and weeds. And of course, this whole central idea got a whole bunch of names. Everything from organic, to biodynamic, to regenerative farming, to agroecology. And while none of these words mean the same thing, they were all kind of moving in the same direction, which was let's create a type of agriculture that doesn't slowly destroy the very planet that it's actually trying to feed. Which of course all sounds great, except that on the journey to try and achieve the rather grandiose planet-saving goal of achieving agriculture that regenerated rather than destroyed, what ensued was a process of sows and buts, where each solution that was proposed instead ended up creating another problem. Here, let me give you an example. We know that animals like ducks or sheep or cattle or wasps have been used in vineyards to replace herbicides and pesticides. The animals then control the weeds and reduce pests, which all seems good. No weeds, no pests. But this didn't solve the problem of the fact that vines were still growing in soil that was essentially as lifeless as when herbicides and pesticides were used. So farmers and viticulturalists then realized that some of the weeds that had been gotten rid of by the animals were actually quite useful to soil life from a whole number of angles. So they started sowing particular types of weeds, the right weeds if you like, in order to improve the life and structure of the soil. As a group, these plants can be referred to as cover crop. And cover crop can achieve everything from preventing soil erosion to helping to fix carbon in the soil to breaking up compacted soil layers with their roots and even boosting nitrogen levels, which is what all those evil fertilizers used to do. But now that farmers had planted all this cover crop in their vineyards, they realized that they still needed to be managed because while cover crops are supposedly good, 
if they're left to thrive and grow wildly, they in turn can become a problem because they will start to compete for nutrients with the vines. Remember, we are still trying to grow a vineyard, not a wildlife sanctuary. So then farmers would go into the vineyards in order to mow down the cover crop or roll it and break it up and leave it as natural fertilizer on the soil. But this in turn increased carbon footprint of using tractors in soils, increased diesel cost, and also increased soil compaction. So farmers solved this problem by beginning to till more regularly in their soil. This, of course, would break up the soil and reduce soil compaction. But in turn, this resulted in turning all those soil layers upside down, which means that the delicate fungi and bacteria that really love being in the cool, dark layers under the soil were now exposed to heat and sun. And guess what? The microbes died, an unfortunate echo of the same situation that used to occur with herbicides and pesticides. And that is pretty much where viticulturalists and farmers find themselves today, trying to solve a list of problems that sees them perpetually sowing their butts. But a good viticulturist will never give up on the fight, which is why Hartenbach viticulturist Wilhelm Joubert was hard at work trying to find solutions to this set of problems that he faced. Of course, Hartenbach have held conservation and regenerative agriculture as a kind of core value for decades and decades, which is why they were already sowing cover crop and they already were using animals in the vineyards. They would even import wasp eggs so that when the eggs hatched, these wasps would be released into the system to attack certain bugs like the mealybug, which is a big problem for vineyards in South Africa, as opposed to using chemicals or herbicides, as many farmers still do. As a little side note, this use of wasps in the vineyard has shown to be dramatically more efficient and also turn out to be far cheaper than the best practice herbicide and pesticide sprays that exist currently. And yet the uptake of this technique of using insects in the vineyards is remarkably slow. It makes no sense. But back to Hartenbach. So they had the cover crop and they had the animals and they even had the wasps. Everything appeared to be harmonious on the surface. But the problem wasn't on the surface, it was beneath the surface. Because as Wilhelm Joubert noted, the soil was every bit as lifeless as it had been before they employed all these so-called natural techniques. But you might interject, how could the soil not be recovering? What about the cover crop? Was it not boosting nitrogen and helping microbial life? Well, yes, temporarily. But as soon as the hot summer temperatures rolled in, the cover crop would die back, exposing the soil. When the sun beat down on the soil, it heated up the soil layers, leading to the death of all the microbes, and the soil reverted to its old lifeless self. But, you might protest again, what about all the animal manure? Surely that would boost microbial life and enrich the soil. Well, Wilhelm Joubert's answer was once again, yes, but only temporarily so. It felt to him like he was perpetually propping the soil up rather than watching it grow into a self-sustaining living thing. And to make matters worse, alongside his lifeless soil, he also had the increased cost of having to sow cover crop each year and then manage that cover crop in a way that didn't either compact his soil, use buttloads of fossil fuel and increase his carbon footprint. It was at this point that Joubert discovered the research of a grazier, yes, that's a real word, called Alan Savory. Alan Savory is pretty fancy and he does TED Talks with like 10 million views. And he's been working on four continents to reverse desertification in a number of different settings. Now, Savory has been an ecologist for 60 years, working all around the world. And for all the things that he has seen and been through, he still feels like his biggest concern for the planet is the crazy rate at which desertification is advancing around the world. And you might ask, but wait, what on earth does desertification have to do with vines and vineyards and viticulture? Well, a desert is really just an expansive piece of land full of dead or dying soil, which is the exact same problem that Wilhelm Joubert had in his vineyards at Hartenbach. The crazy thing about Alan Savory's research is not the rapid rate of desertification around the world, but rather that his conclusion around the solution to desertification is pretty much the complete opposite of what most of us would deem common sense. Now, I think back to high school or even university where we were taught that animals caused overgrazing because they ate all the grass till there was nothing left, which led to soil erosion, which led to desertification. In short, animals caused desertification. But Savory's conclusion is that animals are not the problem, they are the solution if used in a way that has never been seen before in viticulture. Now, Savory did not reach this conclusion lightly. In fact, he's had decades and decades and decades of tests and trials and repeats, as I said, on at least four continents. And the data comes back the same every time. 
if you want to slow the rate at which soil dies and becomes a desert, you need to increase the number of animals in that area, not decrease them. Put in a sentence, more grazing animals in tight herds will save our soils, not destroy them. But let's get back into the vineyards, because as I've said before, while it is indeed on a very mini scale, the sort of lifeless soils that Wilhelm Joubert was experiencing at Hartenberg was in fact just a kind of variation on the theme of desertification. So Wilhelm began scheming on how he could adapt Alan Savory's techniques in order to apply this high density controlled grazing or planned grazing as Alan Savory calls it into the vineyards in order to achieve the same sort of results that Alan Savory was seeing in these hectic deserts around the world. And we need to pause for just a second to realize how crazy this idea is. Because Wilhelm was not imagining a few sheep wandering gently through the vineyards at dawn. Which, by the way, if you like the sound of that, then you can knock yourself out because YouTube is packed full of videos from wine producers who put a few sheep meandering through their vineyards at dawn. But no, Wilhelm Joubert at Hartenberg was talking about something a little different. He was considering driving entire herds of Ancoli and Dexter cattle through the midst of his vineyards. And of course, this might sound absolutely bonkers. In fact, it even looks absolutely bonkers. But it is exactly the sort of high density grazing that achieves the results that are completely the opposite of what you'd think they would be. Put another way, it's the very act of increasing the number of animals per very controlled patch of land that is the difference between dead soils and deserts through to living, regenerated and self-sustaining soil life. So what does high density controlled grazing look like in practice? Well, for starters, the animals are not allowed to meander aimlessly through the vineyards. They're kept in very tight clusters or herds, which is in itself a mimicry of massive herds when they're in the wild. They clump together in order to protect themselves from roving predators. Of course, when they're in these tight bunches, they end up pooing and peeing all over their own food. And so they need to keep moving in order to find food that is a little fresher. So this is how it works. Being grazers, they eat the grass in front of them. But then nature calls and they take a big steamy dump and they have to move on before they've had a chance to eat all the grass down to a level that we would call overgrazing. When they move on, they leave behind them plants that are still alive and able to regrow, as well as manure and urine, which we know about. But the amount of manure and urine is so dramatically increased that it also serves a purpose of being a sort of ground covering, which can in turn help keep soil temperatures lower. So if we take that picture out of the wild plains of the Serengeti and put them into a vineyard, where instead of simply eating the grass in front of them, these cattle are now eating cover crop that has been sowed between the vineyard rows, we begin to see some rather surprising results. So what are these surprising results? Well, the first one is a distinct improvement in soil structure. And a skeptic might say, but surely not. Those heavy beasties roaming through the vineyard rows would compact that soil in no time. But in actual fact, the act of eating that cover crop as they pull the plants up out of the soil, they aerate the soil, but they don't invert the soil layers. So you have improved aeration without microbes being exposed to sun and heat. You also have them moving on quick enough to leave the plants intact so that those roots in themselves improve soil structure. So in essence, it is a classic case of hashtag no till, but with all the benefits of tilling. And in the same way, it has all the benefits of cover crop without any of the admin of having to manage that cover crop. The second surprising result is that of soil temperature moderation and the addition of natural fertilizer. Now, we have mentioned before that sheep have been doing this for centuries. In fact, we see them leaving behind little droppings as a sort of pleasant side effect to the fact that sheep are used to pull leaves in summer or act as weed control in autumn. But, as I mentioned earlier, when you dramatically increase the concentration of that fertilizer addition, you not only increase the nutrients and microbes into the soil, but you also have the second effect of a sort of ground cover, which as I said, prevents the summer sun coming down and heating up those soil layers. So the microbes in the soil are kept safe by the lower temperatures. And then of course, in addition to this thermal protection, the dramatically increased quantity of manure acts as a sort of perpetual slow release fertilizer that is leached into the soil over a much longer period of time. As an amazing little side effect of the project that the Hartenbach team have been rolling out, they've discovered a unique little type of dung beetle that instead of rolling balls of dung away like we see in the cartoons, takes dung and then burrows down into deeper layers of soil, taking the manure down into those layers with it. 
At this point, a skeptic might again pipe up and say, well, you still have the cost of having to sow cover crop again year after year. But here's the amazing thing. Those huge banks of manure that are left in the vineyard rows, in fact, contain all the seeds that were in the cover crop eaten by the animals. And so as that manure begins to break down, those active seeds are released into the soil. And Wilhelm Joubert has patches of vineyards at Hartenburg where he never has to sow cover crop ever again. Because year after year, the active seeds sink into the soil, germinate, grow cover crop, are eaten by the animals, left in the manure, and the seeds go into the soil and germinate again. And so the cycle continues. And Joubert points out that not only is this a seemingly self-sustaining cycle, but because of the dramatically improved soil structure that already exists in those rows, the uptake and success of that cover crop is way higher. Another interesting side note is that Joubert assures me that despite the fact that Stellenbosch had 150 mils less rain this year than last year, the biomass of the cover crop that has grown back is way higher. And perhaps this will make more sense to you once you've watched the Alan Savory video. I've left a link to it in the copy beside this video. But forget about the soil, Han. What about the actual vines? Can we talk about wine for a second? And this is a fair question, but Wilhelm Joubert as a viticulturalist is very reticent to make wild sweeping statements. By nature, he seems to be a very methodical and diligent fellow. And so before he's willing to make any promises, he wants to test more data, run the experiments again, move from the soil to the vines, from the vines to the grape, and only then move from the grapes to the wine. And of course, he has been testing the soil for a number of years now. And the data shows a very distinct increase in soil life from worms to mycorrhizae to microbial life in general. The second wave of testing did indeed involve analyzing grapes on the vines. And again, there were some surprising results. So he decided to perform some A-B testing, where within a block of vines, he allowed half the vine to be grazed by cows and the other half to be managed according to normal crop management, which included the old school rolling and mowing of cover crop. When it came time to harvest the grapes, there was a rather dramatic reversal of the ripening trend. The grapes harvested from vines within the grazed zones managed to reach phenolic ripeness with a far higher natural acid level and also a far lower pH. Probably most excitingly, not only are they going to repeat that A-B test in order to make sure that the results weren't a fluke, but winemaker Carl Schultz is also going to vinify those parcels separately and then analyze the data coming out of those batches of wine. So the Hartenberg team really view all this as very much a work in progress, but they are closely following guys like Alan Savory and graziers like Joel Salatin, who also has a really interesting TED talk called Cows, Carbon and Climate. But the plan is to convert more and more of their vineyards to this way of thinking. And I know that we've spent a lot of time talking about cow poo today, but the exciting thing is that the plan is not just to regenerate the soil, but actually to see it deliver a marked improvement in the quality of wine produced by estates like Hartenbach. Now, as I mentioned, winemaker Carl Schultz and viticulturist Wilhelm Joubert view this as a work in progress, and they'd be very grumpy if I made wild claims on their behalf. So I won't. So instead of making wild claims, I'm going to ask something from you. If you are aware of other producers doing this sort of high density controlled grazing or high density planned grazing. I would love to hear more about it. I'd love to learn about what these guys are doing so that we can add more information to what is really quite a fresh conversation. I am aware of one other producer in the United States, Mariah Vineyards, who are in fact uh, applying this sort of high density controlled grazing. But perhaps there are others out there who've taken the conversation further and who have in fact discovered new techniques that aren't being employed yet. The more that this information is shared, the better it can be applied, tested, and improved. So if you're aware of such projects, please leave comments below with links to the producers and the things that they're doing so that I can go further and perhaps deliver a few follow-up videos on this topic. And finally, if you enjoyed this dramatically lengthy video, then consider subscribing to the Hand Drink Solo YouTube channel where I release videos on viticulture, wine science, wine history, unusual cultivars, and some of the rising winemaking stars coming out of the South African wine. Mm -hmm. Thank you.